may be seated. How many know that our lives are series of obedience steps in what God is asking us to do? So I want you to think about this for a second. Think about the season of life that you're in and the steps that God has asked you to take along the way. And as you've walked in obedience, what he has set you up for. I was reflecting this morning and thinking about the connections that I have to your church. See, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee when I was 11 years old. I gave my heart to Jesus, and I chased after him from that time until now. I went to Central Bible College where I met my wife, Erica, sitting up here on the front row. She's the best wife anybody could ever have, and she's taken. She's mine. So uh, I'm very, very grateful for her. But graduated from Bible College and then moved to Des Moines, Iowa. And I started out in children's ministry, and this was the step of obedience of what God was asking me to do. And this morning, the very person who's serving in the children's ministry, Taylor Quimby, was a child in the children's ministry that I was the children's pastor of in Des Moines. It's crazy. And to think that that step would lead us to a a, a time in India, and then from India we would come back and plant Chi Alpha and plant Chi Alpha here at UNI, that my life would intersect with Pastor Daniel's and Emily's when they were college students here, and for me to just have a small part in their life, and then to see Pastor Derek join the team and come into this season to lead Chi Alpha at this moment, and for Pastor Daniel to lead Scent Church. And now we fast forward. And 20 years ago in August, my wife and I got married, and she was ready to start having babies right away. So uh, 18 months later, our son was born. If you do the math, our son is 18, will be 19 in October. And this fall, my son will be coming to the University of Northern Iowa and will be benefiting from the Chi Alpha that was planted years ago. And I don't say that for me. Here's what I say it for, is all of us this morning have no idea the chain reaction of small decisions that we make in obedience to God and what the result is going to be. And I'm just telling you that as a dad, to come here this morning to preach to you, as a pastor, to see what God has done over the last decade in this community through your pastor and through Chi Alpha, my heart is thrilled that my son will be the beneficiary, <laughs> beneficiary, uh, <laughs> beneficiary of that. And so again, can we just give God praise one more time? That moment really does set up this message. Because as we look at kingdom builders and as we look at the topic of generosity, we have no idea what God's going to do as we step out in obedience to him. When Pastor Daniel told me that he was going to be doing this series on generosity and launch Kingdom Builders at the same time, I got super excited. And before I go any further along in this message this morning, a long time ago, before many of you were born, there was a Hair Club for Men commercial. And so it was a a commercial that advertised to men who were losing their hair. Imagine how I would notice and remember these these commercials. (laughs) And in it, the guy would always say at the end of the commercial, I'm not only the hair club for men president, I'm also a client. You know, it was clear that he had hair growth that was not natural. That came from the hair club for men uh, deal. So I just want to say to you this morning that I'm not only a pastor, I'm also a tither and a contributor to Kingdom Builders. And so this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about a biblical principle that I've been practicing since I was a child. I didn't start tithing and giving to missions when I became a pastor. Instead, I started tithing and giving to missions when I became a believer because that's what believers do. That's a great place to say amen. I'm going to say it again. I didn't wait till I became a pastor to begin tithing and contributing to missions. When I was a child at 11 years old, when I gave my heart to Jesus, I began tithing and giving to missions because that's what believers do. Amen. I've seen the messages that Pastor Derek and Pastor Daniel have been preaching over the past few weeks. And this morning, I just want to continue to build on that foundation that they've laid. I would also encourage you, if you've missed any of these messages, that you would go online uh, and listen to those messages and catch up on what you've missed. Clearly, God is taking all of you on a generosity journey. And I believe that as a result of that generosity journey, that you're going to be blessed and that your church is going to be blessed. 
I know that in some settings when a pastor begins to talk about money or generosity that immediately some of you can like put up walls and, uh, and you, like, you just get upset about it. It can be a sensitive topic. And so I always give this disclaimer when I talk about this, even at the church where I pastor, I say, hey, I know that maybe there are some of you who are at Scent Church for the very first time today. And you just knew that if you came to church that the pastor would talk about money and this just proved everything that you thought coming into here, I just want to say congratulations. Like the one time that I would show up to preach at Sin Church and have this topic would be the day that you would, uh, that you would show up. But I can assure you this morning that I don't want your money. Sin Church doesn't want your money. But God wants your heart. And those things go hand in hand. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 21, Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your love for us and for your word. We ask that over the next few moments that we would sense a demonstration of your Spirit's power. Would you open up our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to understand what you would have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As Pastor Daniel mentioned, I have the privilege of being a board member of Scent Church, and as a result, I'm able to see the financial position of the church. And I love that Pastor Daniel has timed this series for right now. I love that this series is coming from a place of strength, not out of a place of desperation. This morning and in this series is not about uh, a reaction to poor financial position or a cry of desperation. Instead, the church is, is at the strongest place that it's ever been financially. And so we praise God for that. And again, I come back to the fact that this series is more about us as individuals than the church. A couple of years ago, the church that I pastor was positioned very similarly. Finances were the strongest that they had ever been. The bank account was the largest that it had ever been. And I felt led to do this series and to launch Kingdom Builders shortly after. We went on this generosity journey to give away more to global missions, local church expansion, and future Christian leaders than ever before. And I'm telling you, it's been incredible to see what God has done. And if you would have told me then what I know now, there's no way that I would have believed it. And so I want to share a couple of crazy God stories to help build your faith this morning and encourage you along as you're stepping out in obedience to God. A few years ago, right before we launched Kingdom Builders, this was our final drive to raise funds that weren't called Kingdom Builders, uh, we were uh, remodeling some offices in our space. And the goal was to raise $100,000 for that. And my wife and I were talking about, and I would encourage you if you're married to have a dialogue, number one, with God, and you talk to God, I talk to God, and then let's come together and let's see what God has done. And so as we talked about what God was speaking to our hearts to do for the offices, I felt like God gave me a number that uh, was just not right because there was no way that we physically had the money to do that amount. And so I typed in my phone the number and I asked my wife to text me, and then she would see that I didn't change it. And so she texted me the, the number $500. And then I flipped over my phone to her, and it said $5,000. And I was like, hmm. And so seriously, we just let it sit. Like we just had that moment, and then it said the very next day she texts me, and she says, I'm with your number, kissy face emoji. And I text her back, I'm good with your number, kissy face emoji. <laughs> and both of us knew, like, we didn't have an additional $5,000 laying around. Like, it just wasn't there. So this isn't pretentious this morning. Like, we legit didn't have it in our account. But we just felt like God was asking us to do that. And there was nothing on the horizon where we thought, oh, well, this will come through and it will be able to happen. And so Christmas Eve service. My in-laws came up, and my, uh, Erica's grandparents believed in passing on an inheritance to the next generation. And so they had some property that had been for sale for well over a decade. Like, we knew that one day we would get it, but I'm telling you, there was no way that we knew that in that month that we would get it. And so we stepped out in faith and obedience to God, and my in-laws showed up Christmas Eve, and they handed my wife a check, and they said, one of the lots has sold— and I'm just telling you, we were able to write that check and then some because God provided. And so, again, like, we didn't see it coming. There was no way for us to see it coming. 
We approach the end of the year. We're getting ready to launch uh, Kingdom Builders in that following year, and we had raised 93000 of the $100,000 that we needed. There was a gap of $7,000, and I stood up one Sunday, and I was like, church, maybe somebody, anybody can just help us finish this so then we don't carry this into the next year and carry it in with Kingdom Builders. And I gave this passionate plea that Sunday morning to help raise $7,000, and this young lady recent college graduate, recently married, came up to me and she said, what's, what's the difference that needs to be raised? And I said, well, we've raised 93000 We need 100 The difference is $7,000. And she looks at me and she goes, huh, okay. So I looked at her and went, huh, okay. Have a great week. <laughs> you know, like what am I supposed to do with that information? She calls me the very next day. And she said, hey, what's the difference? And I say, you know what? I talked with our bookkeeper this morning, and nothing came in yesterday, not a dime for it. And I'm telling you, I'm feeling like a failure as a pastor. We've been able to raise 93000 We just need seven more, and we can't make it happen. And she says to me over the phone, she said, on November whatever date, I wrote in my journal that God spoke to me to give $7,000 to the church, and this is confirmation that I'm supposed to do it right now. And so she wrote the check, and some of you are like, well, you can write a check for whatever amount you want. Well, I'm just telling you it didn't bounce. (laughs) What's crazy is, again, as we talk about steps of obedience, that young lady is now our youth and college pastor. And she would have had no idea when she wrote that check that one day that she would be sitting in the very office that she helped finish. Come on, that's powerful. So again, as we talk about these steps of obedience and what they lead to, we have no idea the result of it. And so I hope this builds your faith this morning. Let's dive into the rest of this message. How many of you think that prayer is important to God? Yeah, it's obviously, even like two of you raised your hand and some of you are smiling like, did he really just say that? Right, yeah, like obviously prayer is important to God and we value the word of God as followers of Jesus. We believe that all 66 books of the Bible are the inspired word of God. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 puts it this way. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So from Genesis to Revelation, there are over 500 verses on prayer. The Bible is serious about talking with God and hearing from God. If someone says something to you 500 times, they're trying to make a point. And there are about the same number of verses in relation to faith, and it takes faith to pray. In this same Bible that's breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, has over 2,000 verses on money. Do you realize that one out of every 10 verses deals with money? 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus deal with money. 25% of Jesus' teaching addresses finances. Can you imagine if once a month Pastor Daniel preached a message on finances? If he did, he would be more in line with Jesus' ministry than what he does now, but yet he would be met with more skepticism if he did, and people would even ask the question, does he even believe in the Jesus that he's talking about at all? And for the cynic in us, we see the number of times that Jesus talks about money but never one time takes up an offering. He never says we need to add a wing to the synagogue and so let's take up a special offering. He never says, hey, we need a new chariot to reach the uttermost parts of the earth here. Can we take up a special offering? And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's going after the heart before the action. Throughout Scripture, God continually addresses the heart of an individual over an action. Eight years ago, my wife and I planted a church in Waverly. And over the years, we saw the attendance grow much faster than the finances. And what we've observed is that tithing is one of the last disciplines to be practiced by a new believer. They trust God in all of these other areas, but yet still hold on with their finances. And so what we saw is that people will attend a church. In fact, they'll begin serving, and then at some point later, then they'll start contributing or tithing. So I've seen this order, attend, serve, and then give. And not surprising, tithing is one of the first things that stops when people get disgruntled with the church. And so it's the reverse order. They stop giving, they stop serving, and then they stop showing up. But either way, how many know that we've got to answer to God and walk in obedience to him? 
So if you're not tithing, I would encourage you to start walking in obedience to God in this area today. So just over two years ago, the church that I pastor went on a generosity journey, and then literally two months after starting that generosity journey, a global pandemic hit. And I'm telling you that this teaching has changed people's lives. As believers in our church let loose of the one thing that they were holding on to and allow God to get access to their whole heart, he's blessed them. And somehow money in particular can weave into us where it's either toxic or freeing, and we've seen it be freeing. There were two asks that I made of our congregation and two asks that I'm going to make of you today. And it's this, number one, that you would be a tither, that you would bring 10% of your income into the local storehouse and that you would start there. And secondly, that you would give above and beyond that in generous giving with kingdom builders. One of the things that you'll hear Pastor Daniel and hear me talk about frequently is this, is I don't call tithing generous giving. I call it obedient giving. It's simply bringing back to God what he already expects us to give. And so I never refer to tithing as generous giving. Instead, I refer to it as obedient giving. And then anything above that is what we would call generous giving. And so uh, we ask people to begin tithing and then to become kingdom builders to give to above and beyond. And so again, we started this and then a global pandemic hit. And so you all know what happened next. But in 2020, in the midst of a global pandemic, our general fund income grew by 25%, and we were able to give away over $260,000 for kingdom builders. Y'all, that's crazy for our church. And some of these numbers don't even, like, because you don't have the context of it, but I'm just telling you, it was crazy for our church. And then in 2021, our tithe income grew by 20%, and we were able to give over $306,000 away to global missions, local church expansion, and future Christian leaders. And I'm not standing up here to say, oh, wow, look at us. Instead, what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that you cannot outgive God. And we have seen it in our own lives personally. We've seen it in the life of our church. And I just want to encourage you with that. In a season when churches were closing their doors because they couldn't keep them open, because people were walking in obedience in our church to God, our local church was able to thrive and give away over a half a million dollars in the last two years to kingdom builders. And here's what I believe for you this morning is that God has even greater things in store for you. That we serve an abundant, an exceedingly abundantly God, and I'm believing that for you. A number of years ago, I was at a conference where Robert Morris spoke. He pastors Gateway Church, and uh, I was blown away by what he shared. He wrote the book, The God I Never Knew About the Holy Spirit. If you've never read that, I'm so grateful your pastor had a Holy Spirit weekend this weekend. If you missed it, I'm sure you missed it. Make sure you sign up for the next one. But I would encourage you to read that book. And he also wrote the book, The The Blessed Life, which is out on a table in the entryway. If you didn't get one, make sure that you get it. This morning, I'm going to be lifting things from this message from his book. A few weeks ago, uh, again, you received it, and if you haven't gotten it, make sure that you get it today. I want to encourage you now to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13 or scroll on your digital devices to Exodus chapter 13. I believe this is the most important message of this series, and I'm grateful that your pastor would trust me with this message. And I know as a pastor how hard it is to not be up here on the stage. I guarantee you today, this room is electric. People have come in expecting God to do something amazing. And I just know that as a pastor, when the room is like that, and you're like, oh, man, I wish I was preaching today. And so again, Pastor Daniel, thank you for letting me preach today. The title of this message is The Principle of the First. If God is first in your life, then everything will come in order. It doesn't mean that you won't face difficulties or problems or struggles. Instead, Jesus says, as my disciples, you will face tribulation. You're going to face it. We're promised that. But would you rather face tribulation with everything in order or out of order, with him or without him? If he's first, then everything will come into order. And if he's not first, then nothing will come into order. And so I want to show you this principle. This principle runs from Genesis to Revelation. It runs through the whole Bible. And I would encourage you to open up the notes app on your phone or a piece of paper and write some of this stuff down so that you can process it even outside of Sunday morning. Exodus is found in the Old Testament. It's the prelude to Jesus' arrival. In the Old Testament, the way that sin was dealt with was through animal sacrifices. And in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can see that Jesus is the Lamb of God and that he was slain for sin once and for all. And so Exodus chapter 13, verse number 1, the Lord says to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. 
Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. God says it's mine. It belongs to him. It's extremely emphatic, and it's important to understand that the firstborn belongs to him. In verse number 12 of chapter 13, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb, all the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Both of these verses are saying that they belong to the Lord. And in verse number 13, every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. It's important to understand that if you don't redeem it, you're going to lose it anyway. If you want to apply it as we talk about uh, the first in our finances, God says if you don't bring it to me, you're going to lose it. It's going to go out of your account. So the first thing we're looking at this morning is that the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. This is the principle here in the Old Testament, but this principle, again, goes all throughout Scripture. So how do we know what to do? Well, he gives us two categories of of animals that are exemplary. The two categories of animals are donkey and the lamb. The donkey represents the unclean animals, and the lamb represents the clean animals. So how do you know what to do? Well, it says if it's clean, then it has to be sacrificed. If it's unclean, then it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of the clean. So how does that relate to us today? Well, let's ask this. As human beings, were we born spiritually clean or unclean? Unclean. That's right. When we were born into this world, we were born unclean. And I can prove it by asking the the experts in the room, the parents. Okay? Parents, did you have to teach your children to be bad? (laughs) No. You got to teach your kids to be good. They were born unclean. So my wife and I have two kids, an 18-year-old son and a a 16-year-old daughter. My son today is six foot three, and so I get to look up to him. But one day when he was three years old, we had been itinerating in a church, raising funds to go to India, and my wife came up to me at the end of service, and she said, your son's behavior was despicable. You need to take care of it. And so I'm not a barbarian, so I didn't take care of it right there in the hallway in front of God and everybody. Instead, I did as any good parent would do. I took him into the bathroom. And I got down eye level with my son, and he looks at me, and he says these words, where I knew that the sin nature develops very early in a child. He said, Dad, I just want to do what I want to (laughs) do. I was like, well, that's what God has called me to do is to correct that in you. (laughs) We're all born unclean. The sin nature is strong. Some of you are still like, that is still my mantra today. I just want to do what I want to do. Let's just want to do what God wants us to do. Amen. Let's walk in obedience to him. We're born unclean. Jesus was born clean. And the clean Jesus had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read. And that's how important this principle is. And we're going to see that this principle refers to tithing. And I want to say something to you that maybe you've never thought about before. And it's this, that Jesus is God's tithe. And so you give the tithe first. You don't pay your bills first and then see if you have money left over. You don't pay kingdom builders first and then see if you have money left over. You give the tithe first. And it's not just the 10%. It's the first 10%. Because it takes faith to give the first. And God says when your sheep has a lamb, you give the first one. And it takes faith because you don't know if that sheep is going to continue to reproduce or not. And so the temptation would be, God, can I just wait till I have ten and then give one to you? In fact, can I wait till I have ten and then pick the one that's constantly in the garden or is a pain in my neck and sacrifice that one instead? That doesn't require faith. He says you've got to give the first one before you have any others. People think that the 10% enacts the blessing, but it's actually the faith that enacts the blessing. It's given the first 10%. And the reason why Jesus, we see Jesus is tithe is because God gave him first. God gave Jesus first. He didn't wait to see if we would clean up or straighten up before he gave his son. God gave Jesus when we were mocking him, spitting at him, and nailing him to a cross. In fact, Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, Paul says, And God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Romans also says that God gave Jesus in hope. In faith he gave. We give our tithe in faith. It's the first 10%. When the children of Israel went into the promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of God. It's always the house of God. That's where the tithe goes. And why did he say all of it in this time and not just 10%? It was because Jericho was the first city. He says, bring this from Jericho and the rest will be redeemed. They are out from under the curse. The first portion is the redemptive portion. And when you give the first to God, the rest is redeemed. And so God says, don't give the first portion to the mortgage company. The mortgage company doesn't have the ability to bless your finances, but God does. The second principle that we see here is that first fruits must be offered. First fruits must be offered. This principle that works all throughout Scripture, found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And then look what happens. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with vines. I mean, bursting with wine. This is in Proverbs. This is not the law. This is a hundred years after the law. But this is what God wants to do for you and for your church. As you bring in the first fruits, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats bursting with wine. In Exodus 23, verse number 19, it says, The best or the first of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. The first or best of the first fruits, bring it into the house of the Lord. Listen, I'm not a farmer. I didn't grow up uh, in an agricultural community. I grew up in a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. And then I moved to Iowa, where clearly agricultural, agriculture is a big deal. And so I have spent a number of hours over the last eight years riding with farmers in their combines, learning a little bit about farming. So again, I'm still no expert at it. But one of the things that I've learned about farming is that all ground doesn't produce the crops the same way. There are certain acres on a farm that is going to produce a higher yield in, in, than other pieces of ground. And so when we look at the Old Testament and the agricultural tithing, one of the things that we actually see here is that farmers wouldn't wait to harvest all of their fields and then bring 10% of that in. Instead, they would look at their fields and they would say, what are the highest producing acres? We're going to harvest that first and take 10% of that. I mean, not take 10%, take all of that, the first fruits, into the storehouse, and then they would have to trust God on the 90%. What a visual image for us, and this is an image of trust in God. And so we saw last week in Malachi that the tithe belongs to the storehouse. The storehouse is the church, so the tithe belongs to the church. We don't get the luxury of dividing the tithe and giving it elsewhere. Instead, by God's commandment, we bring it to the church. And notice he uses the word bring. He doesn't use the word give. We can't give what's not ours to begin with. And so we bring our tithe. Uh, two cho- there are two choices when it comes to tithe in Scripture. You can either bring it or you can steal it. Those are the only two options. Either bring it or steal it. In Jericho, he said bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho. And Achan kept some of it. And of course the next city, they lost the battle until they brought all of it into the house of God. And in Joshua chapter 6, he calls the tithe consecrated or set apart. In Joshua chapter 7, after Achan took it, God said, Israel has stolen it from me and it's cursed. It's consecrated when you bring it to the house of God and it's cursed when you leave it in your bank account. And why in the world would you want something cursed in your bank account? Why wouldn't you want your bank account to be blessed? And it takes faith to see that 90% redeemed and blessed will go further than 100% cursed. Maybe some of you look at the story of Cain and Abel found in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 5, and you wonder, why did God accept one sacrifice and not the other? And here's why. Let's read it together. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering, not the tithe, not the first fruits, but an offering, the fruit of the ground. In verse number 4, And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. He accepted the gift and the person. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. It's simple to see that Cain was a farmer and he didn't bring in his first fruits. Instead, he just brought an offering. And Abel was a a rancher, and he brought in the firstborn of his flock. And God says, I will accept one and not the other. And it's not that he wouldn't accept it, he couldn't accept it. There are some things that God can't do. God can't act outside of his character. 
God can't change. So we talk about this fancy word, the immutability of God. And the reason why God can't change is because if God could change, then he could get better. And God could never get better because he's already perfect. God can't change. The second thing that God can't do is think the way that we think. The reason why God can't think the way we think is because God is omniscient. And so if we break that word down, it means omniscience, which means all knowledge. God has all knowledge. And the reason why, we can't, why God can't think the way we think is because we think to figure things out. God is not trying to figure things out. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God has never said, you know what, I, I just thought of something I've never thought of before. He knows everything about everything at the same time. In fact, God has never heard something and said, oh my self. You are faster than first service. First people are still trying to figure out what happened right there. So uh, congratulations. He's, something's never happened where he said, oh myself. He, he can't think the way we think. In fact, uh, the book of Isaiah uh, describes it this way in verse, chapter 55, verse number 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. So let me tell you how this relates to this. God can't be second. This is called the preeminence of God. He is preeminent, which means that he is not only first of all, he is before all, he is higher than all, and above all. God is first. And in our lives, we can talk about putting God first, and that's good, but even if he's not the first in your life, he's still the first, because you weren't able to adjust or rearrange his order in the universe. God can never be second. And the reason why he couldn't accept the offering of Cain is because God is always first, and Cain did not bring a first offering. And so he couldn't accept a second place offering because he's always in first place. And he didn't want Cain's, and he doesn't want our participation trophy. So we need to think about this when it comes to the tithe. Remember how we said Jesus is God's tithe. Last week we talked about giving to the bride of Christ, and so we said that tithing is probably more personal to Jesus than we think. And if Jesus is God's tithe, then it might be more personal to the Father than what we think. It represents who's first in your life. And you can say all day long that God is first in your life, but I'll just tell you that if you look at your credit card statement or you look at your bank account statement, that will show you who's first in your life. It might be your Netflix subscription or your Shields shopping or your Amazon or Disney Plus or wherever, but where does that first 10% go? So here's what we see. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. The first fruits must be offered. And finally, the tithe must be first. Leviticus chapter 27, verse number 30. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. Again, it's an emphatic phrase that it belongs to God. It's holy to the Lord. It's set apart, which is why it's stealing. And so that's why it has to be first is because God is first and he owns it. So if we're going to return it, we have to return it first. And some of you this morning are like, I have no idea how to calculate 10% of anything. Uh, I'll just show you the obvious. Uh, these are digital devices. This is called a phone. And uh, on my phone, there's a little calculator app right there. And so feel free to, if you ever can't figure out what 10% is, to just pull out your calculator app. And I bet even your pastor would give a tutorial on how to calculate 10% if you can't ever figure it out. And this might sound silly to some of you, but because I've grown up tithing my entire life, that is one uh, uh, formula that I can figure out rather quickly off the top of my head because it's just been practiced for so long. And I just believe for you, as you step out in faith, as you walk in obedient giving, that the same thing will happen. But until then, feel free to use your calculator app. If you go home and say, here's some of my paycheck for the mortgage and for the car payment and et cetera, that's not uh, God's part. You, give, you gave your part, God, you gave God's part to the mortgage company, and God doesn't have what you've given him is the leftovers, and the mortgage company doesn't have the ability to bless your finances. The Super Bowl took place a couple of weeks ago, and anyone who knows me well knows that, uh, that I don't really follow sports. In fact, uh, I didn't even type in the names of the two people, who, two teams that played in the Super Bowl, and I didn't even ask anybody into uh, my notes. So I'm not even being funny. Like, I don't remember who was in the Super Bowl. So anytime I step into a sports analogy, I get a little nervous, but I think you're going to see something here today that will be true, and it's this. 
that both teams work so hard to make it to the big game. And in that big game, the players are going to give everything that they have and the coaches are going to give everything that they have to make sure that they have the best chance of winning the game. There's no way that a coach is going to show up to the Super Bowl and say, all right, bench, y'all are going to be the starters and all of the starters are going to be the bench. Let's go out and win this game. That's stupid. No coach in his right mind or her right mind is going to start the bench and make the starters sit. So how does that relate to us when it comes to this principle of first? So many of us give God our leftovers or our bench. And in the same way that we think about playing a sports game, there's no way that we would do that. And so let's, let's make a commitment to start our starters, right? Let's give God our first 10% and allow him to bless it and win for his glory. Some of you are in this crazy cycle with your finances, and you think you can't afford to tithe. And so each week you either give nothing or you donate your bench to God, and then you wonder why you can't break the cycle. And God said to Malachi, you bring the blind and the lame, and I do not accept it. So how does it play out when you have uh, direct deposit? Give online those dates. Just go online and give. Don't be legalistic about it. Again, it's about the heart. The first 10% belongs to the church. And so maybe for some of you, the best thing that you could do would be to go online to wearesent.church forward slash give and set up a recurring payment. Exodus chapter 13, verse number 14 says, And when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Let me paint it this way. The son goes away to college and he comes back and his dad says, I, I want you to take over the books. You asked me to take over the books and I've been going through this and I want to talk to you about something. Dad, you might not even realize this, but how can I say this? Dad, every time one of our animals has a firstborn, it gets killed. And this year you've killed 72 animals and we're in the ranching business and this is cutting into our profits why do you do that he says one day your son is going to ask you and when he asks you you say son i need to tell you something about our family that you don't know we weren't always in the ranching business he's talking about the israelites we didn't always have animals. We were slaves. We were in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed us and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, we gladly give to God the firstborn. I want to share a short clip of Robert Morris uh, as he illustrates this this morning. This was written 4,000 years ago. And this principle happened to me. Uh, when Josh was kind of getting old enough to understand numbers and all and he has this mathematical mind like I do and like his grandfather and so one day I was paying the bills now we didn't have online back then and so what I would do is I would write the check first and then I would set the check the tithe check and then I would settle over the side and then I would pay the bills but I'd always write the tithe check first and set it over the side and then take it with me to church by the way for you young people we used to have pieces of paper called checks <laughs> yeah. all right so I said Lord side. So I'm paying the bills and Josh came in and I'm watching him out of the corner of my eye. And he's reading this tie check and he sees the amount, which to a, a young boy looks like a lot of money. And he says, Dad, why are you giving so much to the church? And I remember this scripture when your son asks you. This is what you tell him. And I took Josh and I actually set him on my lap and I said to him, I need to tell you something about daddy that you don't know. But daddy wasn't always a Christian son. And daddy was a very bad man. And daddy was in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed your daddy and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, I gladly give to God the first of all of my increase. 
This is a principle that's all through Scripture. It's called the principle of first. Is God first in your life? Mm. What a powerful illustration. And what a powerful question for us this morning. Is God first in our lives? This is a principle that we see throughout Scripture. I want to ask you today to make a commitment to put God first. My wife and I haven't had the same interaction with our kids that Pastor Robert had with his son, but I would imagine that those conversations would be very similar. When we launched Kingdom Builders a couple of years ago at our church, we already obviously give 10% of our tithe, I mean 10% of our income, which is called our tithe. We already do that. It's a, it's a standard operating practice as believers of Jesus. It's an assumed uh, discipline that we would have. My wife and I prayed and we said, God, what do you want us to do with Kingdom Builders? And, and we'd seen God's blessing the previous year and how he miraculously provided. And, and so we looked at each other and this time we were in 100% agreement and we decided that we would give 10% of our income on top of the other 10% to Kingdom Builders. That's how much we believe in it. And I'm telling you that even in this next season, our son's going off to college this fall, our daughter's gonna go off to college the following fall. Like, Things aren't getting any cheaper for us. It's, yet it's, it's a step of obedience that we feel like God has asked us to do. And again, when you look at the chain reaction of a step of obedience at a time, and look what he does. And so maybe for you, giving 10% to kingdom builders seems just unimaginable. You, you can't do that. I would encourage you today it, to start at tithing at 10% and then begin to take steps above that for kingdom builders and so we look at this powerful illustration of the next generation if my son were to look at our giving statements the same testimony would be true and then here's what's crazy is over the last few years our church's kingdom builders and missions program has helped fund the Chi Alpha here at you and I in a small way and in a small way we've been able to do things uh, financially for sent church and I had no idea a few years ago that my son would benefit from these things. But I'm grateful today that if he were to ask this question that I could look at him and say, we've not always been free. But God set us free. And we wanna be a part of the journey for people around the world that God would set free for the one, for the city, and for the world. Come on. That's what God wants to do. I'm going to ask that you would bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room. I believe that God's going to set some of you free today, that this has been an area where maybe some of you have been holding back, and today is going to be a day where you're going to take a step of faith. And I believe that as you do, that there's going to be a weight that's going to be lifted off of you, that you're going to walk in the freedom and the blessing of God. And one of the things that I said at the beginning of this message is that God wants your heart. So maybe there are some of you who've come into this room this morning or you're watching online and you don't have a relationship with God. And you say, today I need to enter into a relationship with him. Or maybe you've turned your back on him and you've walked away from him. And you say, today I need to see my relationship restored back to my maker. In just a moment with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, you say, I need to ask Jesus to come into my life for the very first time. Or you say, I need to see my relationship restored back to him. When I count to three, why don't you slip up your hands all across this room? One two, three, lift them up all across this room. Thank you, I see that hand. Are there others this morning? Thank you, God. Let's all stand. There was at least one hand that went up this morning of somebody who needs to ask Jesus to come into their life for the very first time or who needs to see their relationship restored back to God. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you raise your hand, I want you to repeat it after me and mean it with everything that's within you. But know that you won't be praying this prayer alone, but that each of us in support of you will also be praying. Let's pray. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've messed up. This morning I ask for your forgiveness. Come and give me a fresh start. Be my savior. Be my king. Take over every area take over every aspect 
and help me from this day forward to live for you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise for what he's done this morning. If you raise your hand here in person or online and you made that decision today, I'd encourage you to reach out to Pastor Daniel or Emily and let them know of the decision that you've made today so that they can encourage you along in that. Each week we leave time at the end of the service. The prayer team's going to come forward here in just a moment for anybody who's come here with a need. And so I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. Worship team's going to lead us in one final song. And as they do, the prayer team's going to come up. And if you've come here with anything today, I beg you, please don't leave here today without petitioning heaven and allowing God the opportunity to meet your needs today. God, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had today to hear your word. Lord, I ask that you would help us to go from here and put it in practice to be obedient to what we've seen. And Lord, I pray that as each of us walk in obedience to you, that we would experience your blessing. God, I pray for the young and old alike, maybe who have been withholding their tithe from the church, that today as they step out in faith and obedience, that they would see you provide for them and bless them in a way that they never could have even dreamed or imagined. We thank you for Pastor Daniel and for Emily for the leadership of the church and what you're doing right here in this community. God, I just pray that you would continue to bless them and their family in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.